In the last video, we talked about helmets used in the Middle Ages. In this video, we are going to review an important subject, the coat of arms. And that was a really, really big deal in the Middle Ages. And they took it dead seriously, as you will find out later in this video. Now, the creation and assigning of a coat of arms is called heraldry. It is not exactly clear where it started, but probably during the time of the Crusades. Some of the first coats of arms are seen in tapestries. The French and Spanish used coats of arms quite early, and the English were heavily influenced by the French and their coats of arms. Well, in short, the English loved it. Now, a coat of arms identifies a particular family, but in reality, an individual is first given a coat of arms. Later on, that will become the coat of arms for his or her descendants. And every noble needs to have a coat of arms. A recent example is Kate Middleton. She did not come from a royal background, so before she married into English royalty, she needed to have a coat of arms designed for her. And again, this took place before the royal wedding. The coat of arms is known as the Middleton coat of arms. Now, not all coats of arms are equal. There are lesser coats of arms and there are greater coats of arms. And lions are often used to represent the kings. Now, one of the main reasons that coats of arms were initially used was to find out who's who in battle. Who are your friends and who are your enemies? You might be able to look across the battlefield and see a knight with a particular shield or flag that had a coat of arms and you would have known by that emblem that that's the enemy. So again, coats of arms were made for battles. Most of the time, the coat of arms was on the shield. The emblem also might be worn on your armor, for instance, your breastplate. And everyone knew them well. A modern analogy might be individuals who wear t-shirts of their favorite sports team. There is usually an emblem that identifies that particular team, so everyone knows who you are rooting for. Now, there are some modern historians who do not believe the coat of arms served any military purpose. I do not agree with this. Imagine you are a knight in the heat of battle, and you are fighting other knights. With all of that armor on, how would you know if that particular knight is your enemy or friend? What is not in doubt is that coats of arms were and still are a major status symbol a symbol of power and prestige. They were also used in tournaments as well. So let's examine the main parts to a coat of arms. The most important part is the shield, and you can see that right here. And the shape of the shield varies from each coat of arms. And so they can be different depending on what region they are designed in. This is the helm or helmet, and the helmet would vary on the individual's rank. This is the crest. Now the crest usually appears above the helm, as you can see right here. There are also supporters, and those are usually some sort of animal. It might be a lion, it might be a horse, something like that. This is considered the wreath right here. And there is usually a motto, which you can see right here. Now this particular coat of arms does not have a name, but sometimes the name of the individual or family is also included. Now the colors also have meaning. There are four primary colors, red, white, gold, and green. Red usually represents the military, but it can also represent a martyr. Gold represents generosity usually, while white usually represents peace. Green usually represents love or joy. Now, each coat of arms is approved by the College of Arms in London. The College of Arms was founded by Royal Charter in 1484 by King Richard III, and it is still active today. So the College of Arms is the sole authority for all coats of arms in England. This is a quote from the College of Arms website. Quote, as well as being responsible for the granting of new coats of arms, the college maintains registers of arms, pedigrees, genealogies, royal licenses, changes of names, and flags. Now, the College of Arms is overseen by the Earl Marshal. So again, the Earl Marshal and the College of Arms have a lot of power. They decide what your coat of arms are. The Earl Marshal is also responsible for the organization of a new coronation. So he will tell everyone at that coronation where they sit. And that is based on how royal you are and what are your coat of arms. The Earl Marshal is also called the King of Arms. The Earl Marshal has several heralds that report to him. The heralds are often called Herald of Arms. The Earl Marshal can also delegate his responsibility to heralds. So here is the process for obtaining a coat of arms. You submit your request to England's Earl Marshal and the College of Arms. The College of Arms can either agree or disagree with your new arms. And once they are in agreement, you're in. Near the end of the Middle Ages, there were rampant problems with coats of arms. 
Basically, there was widespread abuse of coats of arms. Some individuals were using emblems for which they had no rights to. Thus, the King of England tasked the King of Arms to survey and record those who were using coats of arms. These individuals would have their pedigrees and genealogy examined very carefully. Any irregularities would be corrected. So the heralds were dispatched to every county in England to undertake these surveys. These became known as the heraldic visitations. These visitations primarily took place from 1530 to 1688. So here is how the process worked. The herald would announce his presence in a particular county. The bailiffs would then notify the nobles or anyone that was using a coat of arms to appear before that herald at a particular place. This was usually at an inn, but sometimes the herald would visit the noble at his particular manor or castle. These heralds had great authority. Any decision they made was final, and there was absolutely no right of appeal. The herald would have been accompanied by a staff. This would have included scribes and draftsmen. The draftsmen would draw the coat of arms in order to keep a permanent record of it. Now, once a knight or noble arrived, they were expected to prove their lawful right to the coat of arm or coats of arms they were using. Again, this meant you needed to prove your lineage and to prove you had rights to use that particular emblem. Now, if you failed to prove your right to use a coat of arms, you were disclaimed. This meant that any shields or any other items containing your coat of arms were removed from your castle and confiscated by the heralds. The names of the disclaimed were entered into a book for that particular county and stored at the College of Arms in London. Apparently, there were some instances where disclaimed nobles simply put their coats of arms back up in their castle after the heralds left. I mean, if you were way out in the country, what did you care? I imagine, though, you couldn't attend any official functions in London or anything like that. Now, if your pedigree was in order, your name along with your coat of arms was entered into the same book as well. Your entire genealogy was also entered. Again, the book with all the records from that particular county was then stored at the College of Arms in London. Here are some other tidbits. The inheritable right in a coat of arms could not be sold. So you held a coat of arms by right of inheritance. There were some minor exceptions to this rule. For obvious reasons, sometimes nobles were very nervous about appearing in front of the herald. So they might come up with some excuse to be out of town during the visitation. Others would rush to get a fresh drawing of their arms prepared. There were some instances where your pedigree was approved, but your coat of arms was not. You were not disclaimed, but you could not use that particular coat of arms anymore. Amazingly, these books with these lists of nobility still exist today. Let's look at one of these books from Shropshire County. This is a county in Western England. By the way, Charles Darwin was also from this county. So if we take a look at this book, it was taken in the year 1623. Imagine that. And it's called The Visitation of Shropshire. And you can see right here the herald is Robert Tresswell. And he is accompanied by Augustine Vincent. And you see this name in French right here? He's in charge of the coat of arms, so probably verifying the coat of arms that the nobles are presenting. You can see that that name is in French, and so you can see again the French influence in the English coats of arms. Now you'll notice here that it says they are marshals and deputies to William Camden, so he is the king of arms during this time period. We'll also see that this book, published in 1623, also contains data from 1569 and 1584. So you can see here, here is one of the families, and these are the Actons. So this is the Acton family. And you'll see they have three coats of arms. Now take a look at that. Look at all that information that they have entered. Just amazing. It's like its own language, isn't it? Here's the color azure. You can see they're mentioning that. And here are three lions that they talk about. And you can just see how detailed this is. And then here is the pedigree that I talked about. And this is much larger, by the way. This just goes on and on and on. But it starts out with William Inglis, and he apparently had three daughters. You can see them right here. One of the daughters had a son, Thomas, and Thomas had a daughter named Isabel, and she married Reginald Scott. And this just goes on and on. The entire family's genealogy is listed in this book. And there are hundreds of these families. Pretty amazing stuff. Now, if you are one of the unfortunate that was disclaimed, you are also entered into this book. And this is what was actually written by the Herald. And the most important thing here, you can see, at this present making survey with the said county, have found these persons whose names are written without any good ground or authority 
to have usurped the name and title of gentleman, contrary to all right and to the ancient customs of this land and the usage of the law of arms, which name and title they are from henceforth no more to use or take upon them. Right here you see the names of the individuals that have been disclaimed. The first one is Richard Millward of Shrewsbury. And you can see they have the towns where they are from. And you'll notice right after that it says no gentleman. I mean, it's like they have to add insult to injury. You're not a gentleman. And then they abbreviate it. No gent, no gent, no gent. For all the rest of the individuals that have been disclaimed. And this is a much larger list. I'm just showing you a very brief portion of this. Okay, that is going to do it for this video. I will see you guys in the next video.